He's gonna get me. I know. I got you. I got you now because that's on tape. <laughs> <laughs> to tell me where all the barracks were and everything and all yeah, that. Let, let Mr. Clifford be. Oh, oh, wait, wait, yeah. Get the brine, get the show. I'm going to get over here with this. Yeah, get the You too? Yeah, I got a good picture of you. I need a couple of you to tell me where the barracks were. Oh, he's shooting right towards where they were. Okay. I need you to get out there. So I can get a picture of you. <laughs> Sir, why don't you get out there with him? You know where they, you were here in the first group. Oh, Judy, why don't you go out there and ask us some questions? Okay. Okay. How okay. far you wanted to go, Joe? Well, whenever. Okay. Okay. That's... Wait a minute. I need to get you on tape too. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was a while ago. I got. Oh, I was gonna ask. Um, can I get you to move it just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. But that was generally the purpose of all of them that was in here, was to help the family. I mean, that was a requirement for us. Yeah. 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 December, they 
I hired us, told us, frankly, it was temporary until then to make the spring planting. We were to go to the field and uh, uh, locate the sites, and uh, they were planning to buy them. They sent appraisers down. I don't know how many of them they actually bought. I think most of them that we made that spring. And uh, we were very disappointed in the amount of appraisals. I learned about government appraisers then, I'll tell you for sure, because uh, it was really valuable land that we that was shown to us and it was selected for these sites. And they wanted us to select deep soils that needed protection from wind and with people who would uh, follow this up. And Curtis is a prime example. You see that today here in the, in the younger members of the family that are here. Uh, a deep interest in uh, everything. So we talked to some people who were not interested in seeing that much of their land go because the pattern in, you know, was 160s and uh, half sections. Yeah. It was a major farm, you know, that's a good farm size. And uh, lots of them was, of course, was some bigger than that, but that was an average size place. And you could consider taking several acres of this land out. But they were also aware, everybody we talked to, when you really got serious with him, he'd tell you that uh, he he wouldn't make much on the way it was. And if there's anything he could do uh, that would protect it, he'd ready to try. And there were some prime examples, and one of them was up there at Lake City. And I, I would like to ask them again who that man was. It was a Belgian uh, farmer, and he had almost half of his 160 in trees. And he had about five acres around the house he called his woodlot, and um, uh, he had a good orchard in there. And had a lot of one and um, three row plantings, you know, uh, in through the middle of his place. Now, the outside was really a barricade of, of uh, trees, but in the middle of his place, and I thought then I detected something that maybe ought to come someday, that maybe if we had this uh, uh, protection from the uh, uh, outside edge of your place, that we could have a lot less inside, take up a lot less land. And you could see, I grew up in that sandy country, and I knew all about that way. We were on about 30 miles south there, and the land just, ours, most of our farming land was in the bottom. But it blew. And during those years, I mean, it, it was all blowing because it was clean, cultivated land. And we were close to cotton gin. We put burrs on it. They did everything. You didn't have a lot of cover crops. I walked down the middle of the cotton rows and planted uh, grain sorghum, I mean, uh, small grains in the fall oats usually with a one uh, horse or mule pulling a little one row yeah, drill. I've seen them. And it also made a little pasture when you turned in the, in the cattle. So that had to kind of hold it together. But most of them were realizing, and this old fellow told us to come up there, like you told us to come up there, about all trees we wanted to. He said, I don't want to sell any land. But I said, he said, I could use some more trees. He said, I can grow more on <laughs> half of it. That's the statement he made to us. Uh, without, uh, with the trees, and I could on all of it if they weren't here. And he was thoroughly convinced. I don't know his name, but I, I imagine a place still there, and if he or any of his people have anything to do with it, I'm satisfied the trees are still there. And I believe, I know um, uh, Mrs. Curtis would uh, remember. I don't know whether uh, Claude does or not, but uh, I know she would remember who they were, because they were neighbors there. It's not very far away. Well, who was your actual employer? I, SCS or no, no, sir. It was Forest Service. It was a Great Plains Forestry Program where our titles were Shelter Belt Assistance. It was a, that was a temporary title, I suppose. I don't know what it was, really. But uh, we were uh, paid in, in, uh, uh, from that program. Uh, I visited with Eddie Whitehead the other day. Yes. And I'm sure you worked with him. Yes. And he indicated that he was one who, one of the people who went out and inspected the land right. and made the determination as to whether or not it was uh, should suitable. Be suitable and exactly right. And he was the at program. Clinton, and I was I was at uh, in, at uh, near Alvis. I was at uh, Victory where I where the family farm was. I stayed with mom and dad because, like I saw this morning, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was a good job then. A lot, a lot of money, or what we think about now. I don't remember what our mileage was on our cars, but I drove. Uh, I got a, a car that was a demonstrator, had less than a thousand miles on it. At the end of that four month period, I had 14,000 miles on it. I had a full new set of tires. I'd cut them off on those roads where there'd be a piece of metal or something in the road that blow the 
dirt away and there's a piece of metal I cut those tires off. All of them were from cuts. I had a full set of tires and food spare at the end of that spring planting season. This thing is coming down the, um, uh, we, we got soil that a lot of it would grow alfalfa, some of it was a little too sandy for alfalfa, but this planting at Hobart definitely on Dr. Bungard, right. Thank you. <coughs> Fifty years is a long time. <laughs> and uh, but I, I remember now we had debated uh, getting some other sites there, and that's what I was doing after the day that dust storm struck. I was on past that site uh, on the side of, on the south side of the road. I do not recall the farmer's name, and I had no further negotiation with him except to visit with him about uh, something concerning these uh, sites. He might have even made an inquiry. But I'll never forget that dust storm. Uh, and it, uh, it was it was scary. It makes you wonder what's coming next out there. And I don't think anybody can adequately describe it unless you were there. It was uh, it was almost horrifying. Now, I've seen tornadoes and everything else. And I figured I could get out of the way maybe or get in the hole in the ground. But this thing bothered you in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have dust on you deep enough to bury you almost. I remember, I, they talked about these housewives things. I remember my mom. We'd uh, sweep up the dining room, kitchen, everything, get a scoop shovel, and throw it out. Yeah, that's an honest fact, if I were told. It. Uh, what was that five years ago? I appreciated the comment from uh, uh, anthropologists today, uh, Kerr in saying that um, there was a lot of land that we might have cultivation that might not ought to be. And there's a number of approaches, but certainly these trees, uh, uh, the main talk in the newspaper articles, which uh, somewhat was adverse, but a lot of it uh, giving the idea of what they, they, hep they hoped uh, as a, almost set up as a goal to modify the climate, which I don't think you'd do much with that, except immediately adjacent to that site. And, uh, but I was living and learning, I'll tell you for sure. And uh, there was not a finer person in the world who had charge of no poem than George Phillips. He was a trooper to us. He taught me a lot of things. This thing he told us about going out to talk to these people. And of course, gee, I was uh, 21 year older, 22, going in there to talk to uh, men that were 50 and 60 years old and a lifetime of uh, farming and experience. But I've never had a nicer from the people that we contacted, they were just about ready for anything. And it'd be sad to see that have to come again to keep us prompted on staying on this program, the way I feel about it. And uh, I have felt all my life that and I'm still planting trees and I get a real enjoyment going back and seeing any that I ever had anything to do with. But one generation plants the next generation's tree. And that's something you've got to remember. Lloyd, were you living up around Carnegie at that time? Well, at the time the shelter belt program was started, I lived over in the Sickles community, but we we didn't live in as really as uh, sandy a country as some very close to us. And my dad said, well, he didn't believe he wanted to put in a shelter belt. Of course, we had a little problem, but not, not too bad. And then we moved over. Uh, close to Eakley, straight north to Carnegie, 13 miles. And when we was over there, we had most of our land was pretty good concrete bottom land. And so we didn't, uh, I guess the program was still on, but we didn't get into it. That was 19, 1940. And, uh, but I told the, the lady this afternoon here when she interviewed us, I told her that I knew a lot about shelter belts because the man right east of us, Mr. Studeville, he had a shelter belt along his farm there, along the highway, uh, to the east, and another one to the west. And where the Cobb Creek Store and Cafe was put, why, those trees have really done real well in there. There's there's some real pretty trees in there. There's a uh, honey locust, uh, prettiest honey locust I ever saw was there in that, in that shelter belt. 
and there's some real pretty hackberry and some some uh, cottonwoods that are just just about as pretty as you can see anywhere up down there. But when you come up out of that bottom, go up on that hill there, where I figured it's pretty close to Sand Rock, they're not so pretty up there. In fact, some of them didn't didn't die. But I told her that I believed in the Shelter Belt program. I think it's a real fine program, especially on land that's real bad to blow. Now, right in north of uh, this is a little bit off the subject again, but still, right in north of uh, Allen's few miles, we went down there and bought uh, peaches. And there's some of the sandiest land. We went east about three three miles. Now, that's the sandiest land I was ever in. The man down there, Mr. Dempsey, Clifton Dempsey with his name, he told us they was there. He said, now, don't you don't you drive out in the end of the road that I haven't got to lay out. He said, if you do, you'll get stuck. And we didn't, but now that stuff is a different kind of sand than, than we had where I live. And when you get in that kind of sand, kind of like, like it's been washed and poured out. That's there. right. And boy, I'll tell it you right now, good pieces, oh, that raises good pieces. So there, out. there's a place for shelter belts, but some places I don't know whether it's a place for. But when you get this real shown up sandy type down, it's a real fine thing. I'll tell you that. Well, the topography is not too rolling. There are so many specialized. Oh, that's right. Including peaches and uh, things like that. Now, if it was real rolling and then sand, no, this, this it'd have some problems. But this land, he talked about it very lays, gently rolling. It lays pretty oh, nice. It's pretty flat. It lays pretty nice. That's in the Warren community. Well, when I tell you, it raises good peaches. That's, that's close to where I was born. Boy, that's, that's, that's good peaches. Well, it, it's not very far to, to that North Fork of Red River, is it? No. In fact, if you, you get in a little more rolling and yeah. go right on the Red River. And that North Fork of Red River, some of that. Now, I was in a patch of ground at one time southeast of Sayre one time. In fact, I went down there to look. A guy had a, six, a farm of 60 acres of peanuts. Only one to rent. And we went down and looked at it. Now, I'll tell you, that's the same, some of the sandy stuff I ever saw. And I decided I didn't. And then I found out later, the old boy rented it, lost about a third of it. And they just blew, they just blew them out. Jess, I was wondering, I think George Phillips has mentioned that there was a lot of opposition to the program when it first started. I was wondering whether that reached down to your on the ground level or whether it uh, stopped higher Yes, and, and it was new. I, I say news media opposition to it. Hmm. I mean, sir. They saw it probably as a boondog. They ridiculed it. I'd put it, that, I'd put it that way, and I'd tell them if they were sitting here today. They, they act like they set out for no other purpose than to destroy it. Hmm. And uh, that's why they cautioned us so much that we can't afford to let this one fail. They said, we've got to put it on good soil. We want it down by the road or in communities where it can be shown. And just like uh, like I said this morning, uh, that one, for instance, there at Holbrook was right next to the highway. Now, that wouldn't be, uh, that's not uh, a maximum amount of protection, but it is a perfect place to show what a shelter belt looks like. And there's first, first four or five, we were all conscious of that that was going there. It ought to have been a quarter of a mile or half a mile back to protect some good cropland. But that's neither here nor there. It was it was done for a purpose. And they told us repeatedly, and most of us were farm boys, and we knew land, uh, and being a horticulturist, especially I knew land that would be trees. And uh, all of us selected that kind of size. Well, the opposition didn't come just from uh, the landowners and from the media. It came from professional foresters and people in very high administrative I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Now, Mr. Phillips could have told you a lot more about that than, than well, I could have. Maybe I did, shouldn't have stated it quite so uh, strongly as saying opposition, but there was a lot of concern as to whether it really was, a, was going to be a viable, or you may be able to add some of this, but really a viable program that was uh, would pay off in the long run. There was one thing that a lot of them were concerned about, and that was the uh, purchase of it, you know, of any of it. Or continued purchase. They talked like when they first started, you know, they just go buy these strips mm -hmm. and they'd be permanent. Well, you can imagine what that would have cost, and you can imagine also when you uh, think about it what uh, a crew it would have taken to maintain it and all that kind of stuff. Now, I think the route it has gone, but you have to, a thing conceived so quickly, almost an emergency like on the way to the uh, emergency room with this situation. They have to make some quick decisions. And uh, personally, I think they were, uh, looking back from now, and they looked all right then to me when I, I got the, um, from people like uh, Phillips 
and the man from Washington, I don't remember who he was, had briefed us and uh, told us what they wanted, they expected us to do and what they wanted us to do. And uh, that's, uh, those first sites were ones that uh, would certainly grow trees and had a purpose for being there. And, uh, but I can see why, if we were to, to think about, uh, I can see why the media may was, maybe was concerned about the fact that it would put a lot of land into uh, federal control and things like that. It would be opposed just as much today as it was just the same answer. But it has taken a right turn, and, and it's a better turn than if it would have continued that way, I think. I think it, it, needs, uh, it needs the care of a person who's on that job. I mean, not a sound person. A man like this man owns that land. My dad planted five acres after he saw what those were doing down the strip, down the side of our sandy. So when they talk about raising those watermelons, Leonard going after those this morning, we always had about five acre packs. And that was customary for a neighbor to come get watermelons when he wanted them. <laughs> I can remember something. I don't know. Some debate. Journal of Forestry. Some pro and some con. I remember one name, Kellogg. Did you know of a, a forester by the name of Kellogg at that time? Uh, that name is. Uh, <coughs> determined uh, what the spacing would be, what the design would be initially. You, know, you didn't have anything to go by. You didn't know what the distance between the rows should be or the distance between plants should be. How did how did they go about determining that? A good part of that was more or less, um, I don't know who made the decision, but uh, started off, as I recall, it was to be uh, wider, uh, it's going to be uniform spacing between the, the uh, tree rows or shrubs with intending for the uh, deciduous trees in the middle, of course, to lose a lot of their branches if they got tight and grew them up. But I guess uh, they just said plant them about six feet apart, and if a crew had a, had a long-legged man run that shovel, you got, good, you got them close to 40 inches. And you had a, I never told you why it was six feet apart or anything, huh? No, we were just looking at the size of the trees, and uh, I don't know whether somebody uh, studied it from the standpoint of what they'd look like, or in the woods, what they'd look like. I think they wanted them close enough. Now, I'm assuming it was just more or less arbitrarily decided that we could die. I think that may you have know, been. forestry spacing is not six feet apart, or, or whatever that was. Yeah. It was they close. said a couple of steps is what we uh, did in the row. I think uh, maybe somebody had enough forethought, or somebody understood it well enough, that they thought that these trees had to create their own environment. Uh, trees growing close together is kind of a mutual benefit. There is a symbiotic relation. That's yeah. right. I agree with you. Okay, then. I, I agree with you. And uh, there, there was also uh, we uh, we knew they were going to be clean cultivated. And they said, for goodness sakes, not try to get it for someone who wouldn't take care of them. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't clean cultivated, we knew it was doomed to begin with. To get them started, because we didn't have irrigation or anything like that. It had to be the best plan and things like that. Planning in north of Martha somewhere, I don't know just where it was, and one went out west of there. And I think that was done a year or so after I planted, but I'll never forget the impression of that on my dad. Um, and I come home one time and it's been a good season and they were growing. He just got me in the car and took me by to see some of them. And I was never as surprised in my life the amount of growth. Of course they were just as clean and nice, it looked like a clean cotton field that they'd been handled done right. Remember the number of years I should have some or some pictures of some of them. Uh, but it's interesting to me. Well, in nearly any in nearly any kind of a project, there always has to be a first. It has to start somewhere. And so this one over that we're going to see tomorrow is designated as the number one shelter belt. But this really was kind of going on through the whole plains area at about the same time, wasn't it? It, it oh, yeah. didn't start yeah. here and then oh, just oh, moved oh, north. Oh no, it was everywhere. It was a <laughs> oh, yes. That's what I thought. Yes. So I and I heard somebody say.
say today our number one is located in Soto. Do you have a number one in, in South Carolina? I don't know. I know. Uh, I know where the PSFE plannings are. And that's about it. Yeah. I don't have one. Uh, some of them might not have got going that season. I think some of it hinged on a quick survey of if we got the stock. And if it did, they might not have gotten a big rush if the state did not have either in private sources or otherwise. I think any state in the High Plains that would have had an available stock would have made some planting. I mean, right along about almost uh, simultaneous. That was my understanding. The problem so farther the north is it probably would have still been frozen up. Yes, yeah. of course, there's on later. I mean, as yeah. I say the same right, planting same season. season. The season went north. <laughs> they would have been a little bit after we were, but it would have went right on north. Well, the man from uh, Nebraska Nebraska. Uh -huh. yes. I'm sure Nebraska was quite aggressive in, in the uh, program, and I know Kansas was. But as far as designating or where a number one or, or something like that was, I, I don't know what uh, would have uh, been their program, because we were so busy. Uh, and when you think about it, we had to go out and pick these sides, uh, talk to people. We were talking to everybody, and, and like I said, George Phillips told us when we started talking about this story. Yes, begin at the beginning, tell them the whole story, don't skip anything, and we wouldn't have any misunderstanding. And uh, it was true, you know, we didn't tell them it was going to be easy. We told them it had to be somebody that appreciated the tree and was willing to cultivate it in the hopes that he'd get some return from it in protection. And uh, there's a little bit of, a little bit more than that. Uh, and they were, they were leaders, there's no question. The county agents kept us. They had picked out some people that were the finest to contact and talk to. Bill Beck was worth parts to us at a Canadian. I mean, in, uh, in, at Mansell, in uh, Greer County. And uh, all of them that we, all of them we talked to, I don't remember all of their names. I, they come to me in the middle of the night some day. I wake up and tomorrow I'll forget again. But I remember. All of them were just very cooperative and, and, uh, and had people in mind. And then we went with them and drove through their areas and so on. Of course, I was familiar with southwestern Oklahoma, uh, but not in detail until we began to work in that program. We stayed dry a long time, <coughs> too. You know, uh, in 36, after I went yeah. to work for Soil Conservation Service, I went back out there. And that, uh, they sent me back from Ardmore from the demonstration project work. Uh, uh, they were building these ponds. There's nobody there. And our, we lived west of Martha on the river. And of course, we uh, were in the bottom and had could grow a little bit of stuff. As I recall, there was two and 8,700 inches of rain from the time cropping season start to harvest. Well, and uh, Dad got several showers and raised all that. We called them cotton showers. And he raised all cotton. We, we, we left our home up on the highland terrace next to the river. Going toward Alphys, there was not a single living plant in the fields. Cotton got about that high. It just fell over. Grain sorghums did the same thing. In that area, I don't recall whether there's any wheat or small grains in there, but that ground was barren. These old boys had these big fine beans over. They had no hay or nothing. And the thing was, we went out there and uh, got these... Uh, uh, big Fresnos and built ponds. And they helped select the sites, and I was familiar with the pond building program. Uh, uh, of course, the engineers, they sent engineers, sent soils men. I went with the soils men and had mapped. They sent me because I knew the county commissioner, and we had to have their cooperation like you did on some of the other programs that I heard mentioned today. And uh, we were going in there in 36 nights. Uh, it stayed a long time. I, it's a miracle to me, in a way, the way the trees, the planting, come through. I've got a question about that. Uh, we talked about the uh, nursery stock was a, there was a shortage of it, yes. and uh, that one of the speakers was talking. Well, is the nursery stock that we're producing today any better? It, when you were out there inspecting, uh, were the planters themselves were they calling on the site? That the stock that came in, or they were just planting everything that came in. Oh, uh, you mean the ones that came to that? Now the trees that, that came out there for us were excellent, one to the year old. 
Uh, most of the said just the one year stuff. Of course, the airstreams were different. They had to be two uh, year stuff. But uh, all of the uh, all of the uh, the said just stuff was excellent seating. They weren't long. There's a bundle. If you saw this picture that you had a back. Uh, there's a uh, somebody way back over in the background. That could have even been me. We, uh, and I don't know whether he was in that row planting that first tree. I don't. It seemed like to me the one takes a picture and so forth. And they said, well, we just all plant one. Everybody plant the first tree. <laughs> and I <laughs> broke up a bundle and handed him a tree. Everybody got a tree. Me or somebody. I know I, we were getting ready to start the cruise, and uh, they wanted to take some pictures. And certainly he was a, a big part of it. And, uh, I'm not sure it was in the row where we left it. It might have been dug up, moved. Uh, really realize that kind of controversy you started. Yeah. Well, uh, really, that isn't important. Uh, I feel like I feel like it's uh, a symbolism, and whether that first tree was on this corner or that corner, or if it's this end that we started on the south side of that trip, I can tell you that. And um, and the plant through it came back. So uh, I'd say the first tree in the first row could have very easily not all five of them been planted all five rows simultaneously. I know one thing, some of them crews, they tried to outdo each other. I wish I had a bunch of good land or some kind of a job and could find that many good men to help me do it. <laughs> they worked, I'll tell you, they took out down those roads, planting those trees. And How did you you know didn't what, have to tell them but once. What type of trees did you plant? I don't know all of the species on that, but we had cottonwood, we had uh, black locusts, honey locusts. We had mulberry. That's one that uh, I had my doubts about. I don't know how, how it's turned out. And, uh, of course, I had my own idea of what I thought would have been good, but uh, it's what we could get and what was available is what we used. Now, where would you get the trees? They came from nursery. Oklahoma's uh, uh, nursery. Just, them most just local nursery? I or? think, frankly, all of ours came from up there. But uh, the cottonwoods, uh, like they said, some of those may have been dug or pulled along the uh, uh, stream. Got a lot of them on our place, I guarantee you. I've seen some good ones right out in the cotton field with old and cotton. Yeah. Those <laughs> fellows will stand up that high. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that was a sad experience on those uh, cedars that, that I had to, had to turn down. They had uh, contracted, they had advertised, and advertised that they must be dug because they were not satisfactory to plant would die if they weren't dug. Uh, and this fellow, I don't recall his name or anything, but he was ready to deliver them, and somebody had seen them and discovered it. And me being the youngest of the crew, they sent me down to turn them down. And they had pulled those cedars, and that strip set the coating off of that root. Well, all the lower tip of it, see, was peeled off, and there was just that core of that root there. And, and, uh, and uh, they were dead already, of course. We used bucket. We didn't. Our putter buckets would just have water in them. We didn't. We didn't uh, have a place to make any mud. We kept them wet for sure. We explained to them that that had a. We cold. We just told them there's a rosin. We didn't tell them there's an irreversible colloid. <laughs> we told them there's rosin on there, and if it got hard, it was impervious to water, and that tree was dead when it planted. They let it dry. So keep that. Keep enough water in that bucket. No little boy did. They didn't mind carrying a five-gallon bucket with those trees in it. They, they kept wet. We also explained to them that when that dry soil, and a lot of times we were planting in dry, you know, that dry material hit that root, if it was moist, it would it would make a bond and wet the, wet the uh, soil enough to keep it from damaging our soil. And, oh, we had a... Well, who's familiar with the, the requirements of the landowner after the trees were planted as far as, as cultivation and weed control, water? I think he was paid or was to be paid that first year at least. I don't know what after that, but I, I understood he was to be paid that company. I think they mean business. business. I think they mean business back to the planting, isn't that right? Yes. To check yes. on that. Now, I, I didn't do that. They hired a fellow off of the civil service <coughs> register, and they they got older men. I don't know why they were unhappy with us or they felt like they should have a person with a more forester background. I could have been a forester real easy if we'd had a forestry department at OSU. Uh, because I was in, I'm, I'm interested in well anything that grew like that. Kid on, I, I enjoyed it. And we had big black locusts grow around our house. My dad planted all black locusts, and my brother today still cuts all of his firewood and burns all the folks with that. Good tree. wood too. We have a, I shouldn't tell this, but we have about 30 turkeys that stay in that grove. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think my 
brother shoot or let anybody else catch Like the fact that it's, it, it just, it brings you a lot of things. Rewards, I mean, and uh, they get the post. Black locusts get the post. I have another question. This afternoon, if you were here, you know, you saw something on, on Shellerville renovation. Of course, you yeah. people were involved in field planning. I think Shellerville renovation right now involves more of a uh, farmstead feedlot windbreak situation. Was, was uh, the, the thought ever brought up, uh, okay, these trees are going to live and then they're going to die. How are we going to go into a replacement program? Was that ever thought of? Or? It, it, it sure wasn't as far as I'm concerned. Um, but you know, I was thinking up there, and I've run into this in later years. My thoughts are this. Um, now, with looking back, a tree is just like corn, it's just like cotton, except it, it's a long time lot. I tell a man it grows, it may have, it may have twice the span on a given site, a given soil that a man will have, but it grows, it matures, it dies, just like we do. And it's just as in there, maintenance on those sites, <coughs> think about it for a minute, it, it's got to come. You've either got to utilize the wood out there just the tree falls over and plant another one back or you've got to do a major operation. But it fills and dies, an annual crop like corn and cotton or something, it's grown, grown this year, and it's done. And sweet clover's a biennial, alfalfa's a perennial, it has a lifespan. A tree for a given site, a given soil has a lifespan. I don't think, if you look at the design, especially the design of the windbreaks in you know, South Dakota, they put their fast growing short-lived species in the middle to get that hip roof effect. Yeah. And when you do that, you enclose those, and you make that area quite inaccessible, and make it uh, uh, make it such a way that it's difficult to get trees to plant in that narrow space in there. And I don't think there was any, there wasn't very much thought given to that. I, I, I doubt if it was. I, I doubt if it was. Uh, really? That would be my thinking, that there very little it was urgent to get going, and yeah. they said, let's get it, and just for the same reason we put it on the road, so it could be seen, so what, if, if we can get it 20 feet high and get some results, what, we'll talk about where the species goes later. We not, have, there was talk about, you know, the fact that we didn't have all the species. Did wanted. you ever plan any of this rushing all over or something just yes. short out of the head? Yeah. yeah. That's the way they did over there. Yeah. We looked for a while, I don't know whether it had any fun we planted or not, but there were certain talks that was it. Of course, we also thought that that would make a thicket, yep. you know. And I uh, have looked for uh, good varieties of sand plums. There's some of the sand plums that are, oh, gee, they're almost like a tame variety. Yes. In fact, they a lot of them There's a lot of difference in them. And, uh, Did y'all miss? The, the horticulture, ma'am? I just wondered if you planted shoemaker, too. Uh, we didn't out there. But uh, I don't see anything wrong with us shoemaker in the area, but uh, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure this, there was very little thought, you know. well, there sure would have been some different action taken. Uh, I can, I see, a, I see a cottonwood is a fairly short life tree in a way, but if it were planted properly, you see it could be used and cut out and taken out and maybe something replaced in the road. What's compounded our problem too is that we've got American elm being one of our tall trees yeah. here, too. Yeah. And Dutch Elm disease has moved in. And Kill most of them. Yeah, and oh, we've got it. I, I say that, I don't know if Keith will agree with me on that or not, but our number one problem, or nearly number one, in South Dakota is trying to renovate these belts. You saw the picture there, and yeah. it's a mess. It's, yeah. Those trees offer quite an obstacle to anything you want to do in there. And, yeah. and we've either got to come up with uh, something different Well, we're in a lot better shape now to make a decision. Back then, we didn't have elm disease. We didn't know that was going to be a major It wasn't problem. around then. It wasn't around. No. So it wasn't, it wasn't considered, and it should theoretically have grown right up out of the top of that thing and made a beautiful center row or uh, a joining row. I, I don't remember which one they thought it might be the tallest. I think it ever fit with a hinged on the site. But, of course, you read in American trees, you read what an American elm is supposed to look like, and they, they describe a big base type tree. The University of Illinois at Urbana has that kind of trees on campus. 
Down here, they grow like an umber up out in the wind. They don't grow that way. <laughs> they don't grow that way very So well. it depends on where that tree and the environment right. is in and a lot of things like that. That's what happens to it. I was wondering, getting back on your planting crews, how much you paid them and where the money came from, and did you ever have any trouble? I don't guess you had any trouble finding people to work. Oh, gee, that was the least. Yeah. <laughs> that was the least. Uh, I don't, uh, somebody said WPA, I'm not sure. Uh, I do know uh, this program paid for these people. I do know that. We had a lot of uh, emergency authorities. I know uh, even after I went to the nursery uh, section, uh, I could, if we needed a bunch of special tools, I just went and bought them, wrote them, purchase orders, got it. And uh, I know those shovels I bought down in Children's, Texas, bought that way. I must have put up a good story. The old boy knew there was going to be a planting made out there, but he'd taken a government purchase order in a little town like that from a man he never saw before. But I don't know what I'd have done because I'd run out of money running around most of the days and had a government check. I had to stay in that hotel the next day for quite a while. They took that check to the bank to see if it was any good. Brought me back my money before I started home, so I'd run out of funds. I said, well, you, they didn't want to take it at all. I said, well, you can suit yourself. That's the only way i got to pay you. That's all the money i got. Here it is. So he said, well, the bank will open up here in a little while and we'll take it down there. So I cooled my heels and waited and talked to some of the fellows there before we left to go home. But uh, they were really, there really hadn't been almost any, I don't know whether they had a, a professional man down there as assistant at that time or really who had charge of them. But there was not anything ready for that site except that piece of land was ready. And somebody, farmer, somebody had sure got his job done. But they didn't tell. We told our men to bring their shovels and buckets, and they were instructed to do that. And they said, we showed up with more shovels and buckets than we needed, really. They don't pay them by the tree or by the day? Oh, they were paid by the hour. They were paid hour. by the hour a day. And uh, as to far, I, I expect, you know, I threw my travel vouchers, my file away, not too long ago, and I had them way back. I had my personal papers. I got a lot of these dates and, and names so forth. Off of my, uh, you know, several service every so often require you to, to send in um, uh, the order of all your jobs. Of course, I went back as far as my <coughs> experiment station work. I worked on experiment station and then uh, the greenhouses. Uh, and of course, the federal part of the experiment station that I was lucky enough to work on was credited to me in several service time and in later years. They just, you just had ty uh, certain types of stuff was approved and certain was. But, uh, I know when I went to work for SCS, uh, it was uh, 1600 a year. I know what that was. And it was made when I moved on a project and about, they told me that'd be temporary in about six weeks. I went to Ardmore at 1800 a year. Big wage. And for the money, actually, it was, oh gee, it wasn't long. I got enough together to pay $250 down on a $1,750 six room house. <laughs> <laughs> what were you paying the men? What was the hour? These men that work, yeah. you know, I, I I would not be able to say. About 20 cents an hour. But it, it, well, I, I'd, I'd say it would be more than that. You think it would be more? Yeah, I do. I believe it would have been more than that. But you know, I had been working on projects there on the campus. I, I, we got up to 50 cents on a federal project on a greenhouse when I was a senior. Well, that's pretty good. And 40 cents a lot of it, but those early years, are 15 was good, 25 cents yeah. was real good. Right. Now was this WPA CCC or a separate program? That was W. That was WPA of that type of thing, or people who needed help of that nature. Uh, I don't know I wouldn't say officially that the Works Progress Administration was in operation then. I know it was a few years later. But whether it was in operation right then or not, but there was some type of emergency program, somebody we could go to uh, to get the help. I know to get the men. Many of them were farmers. Uh, uh, small farmers and things like that that were just just needed some help. Needed the works really is all they needed. How did you get started with the shelter belt program? How did what? How did you get started with the program? I just made application to them uh, to work. I learned about it through our department. Of course, they got a bunch. I say a bunch. There's only three or four of us graduating horticulture that year. Did you say your department? What department? Horticulture. Where? OSU, Oklahoma, Oklahoma A and M, I should say. <laughs> And, uh, of course, they were looking for a different one. <laughs> I got two fellowships and would have gone on to my master's and doctorate, but uh, I lost them both to the Depression. I 
got one at Washington State on apples, one at Clemson in South Carolina on peaches, and uh, just a few weeks apart, and they were approved and everything, the Board of Regents turned me down. The dean of the department, everybody had signed it and sent them to me, and I was getting ready to travel. And uh, they said uh, the letters they wrote was almost pathetic. They said, with this depression, our own graduates with no jobs, we would be severely criticized if we hired an out-of-state person. So we were looking for anything we could do. And, uh, I would have probably gone on to school one place or the other. I often wonder where I'd have been by now. But I'm not unhappy with what I did, I'll tell you that. I don't look back much. But George Phillips is the one that hired us, state forester. He was the administrator in Oklahoma. The only thing I remember, I was not related to the Shore Vet Project at all. I was stationed in Montrose, Colorado, and I was district ranger there. Yeah. And uh, we got a letter requesting, I don't remember now where the letter came from, requesting us to get some. I think they knew a lot more than they were able to do. I'm sure they did. So if they had been able to call the shots and said, we're going to plant this certain thing, you've seen some different things out there. I don't think it's a question of the, of the um, technical expertise of the foresters or anybody. I think they uh, were in pretty good shape on that count, but they just had to find a lot of this stuff, and get it, and get it in production. If you review that book that was prepared in 35, about the possibilities for shelter belt planting on the plains. They did a great deal of research about windbreaks in Russia, and same latitude more or less, but in other countries. And there's a lot of information, and hundreds of years of experience in windbreaks before we ever even thought about it. You know, a lot of these things were brewing. That's like uh, uh, the conservation end of the PSC. That started in 28. The first stations were set up to make a study. Uh, it wasn't, uh, there's a lot of people, both in government professional people who recognize that some of these things need to be done and uh, we're not, there's no firm program or anything, but certainly people were, were questioning what could be done and where they get the information and what they do and so forth. I'm sure there were. I think, I think one of the early leaders was Dr. Raphael Zone of the Forest Service. I think he wrote that. Well, I might say this, that while we never took part in the wind in the shelter belt program, about in the early 50s, my father bought a 160 acre farm out south of Eakley, and it wasn't too bad along the road there. If you go by there, it looked pretty fair, but you come up far there's a, is a hill, and boy, it was sandy. I can remember when he bought that, there's a hole out there in the pasture, supposed to be pasture, it's so sandy that the thing blew all the time. Well, I mean, when the wind got up by it, it blew. And so uh, then there's a little farm field right south of where this real bad sand hole was, and, and we planted, we got the trees from the nursery over at Norman, and we planted the I think, I don't remember, I think it is eight rows, seven rows maybe, of boat arcs, Osage Orange, down there, uh, right south of this little field that's pretty good. My son-in-law raises peanuts in there now, and boy, listen, it's, it's good peanut land, but it's all bad to blow. Then we went up farther on the hill where that old blow sand spot was, and, where a pasture blow, and you didn't very often see a pasture blow, but it did. Uh, they they eat it down pretty well and kind of rolled around there, and it got some things got started blowing, nothing to stop it. And we planted black locusts and boat arc both up there, several rows of it, and it did a lot of good. And, and my son-in-law, uh, I don't know how many years later, I guess it was about 
maybe 20 years later, he he had some let some guys cut the, the south row of uh, uh, boat arcs, that south row down there out, out. And boy, I don't know how many posts he got, but he sure got a lot of posts. Now, some of them weren't the straightest in the world, but he had some good straight posts. He got a lot of posts out of that thing. And, so, and some of those others up there could be cut, but uh, I don't know if they will be or not. How does a shelter belt affect the wind? It makes the wind go over. What's the relation of the height of the tree to how high the wind goes up? Well, it, they, cl they claim it, it protects it out there for 20 times the height of the trees. 30 foot tree will protect it for 600 feet. <coughs> this is one of the things that we witnessed on that Belgian's place up there. His single row shelter belts, I believe we're about that close. That's almost across a 10 acre track. 660 would be across a 10 acre track. And uh, there was a lot of talk then that if these trees were 30 feet high, they'd give pretty good protection out for across a 10 acre strip along a place, you know. And uh, then it can be, you would also be getting an effect if you had another row there or another shelter belt. You would begin to get your rise on that also. I have always marveled at people back east, you know, talk about they wouldn't live in Oklahoma because of the wind. I said, I got news for you. The same wind that comes through here comes through your country. <laughs> it's just up at the top of the trees up there. <laughs> you don't feel it. <laughs> and it's the same velocity, too. <laughs> Tornado the same up there it is down here, and wind up there the same. I've been up there. I look up in the trees. I live in them now to work. I'll hear something, look up in them trees, and the top ten foot of them things will be giving it that, and there's not enough air to breathe down here where I am, you know, 40 feet down. So uh, that, the same weather systems that make that wind keep going, I don't know if that way. A lot of people just think that, that the wind breaks stop the wind, but it's really a deflection. That's right. It just goes up over. A more, por I mean, I should say, a porous wind break will do a better job uh, lessening the velocity farther downwind than one that's very dense. You, know, you get some, you can get away from creating that vacuum. In other words, if a modest amount of wind can go through the, right. yes, I, 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 I've seen that in print many it, times. They are as right. effective close to the windbreak, but they're more effective farther downwind. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, uh, board wall there wouldn't be near as effective right. as, uh, exactly. and, and protection wouldn't be near as far out. Yeah. It'd, it'd get a turbulence right. a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. Pull it back down a lot faster. Solid yes, board wall from very cattle. Right. Solid. Solid wall from board wall from very cattle that are hiding behind it to get out of the snow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I told that reporter this evening, uh, my wife and I sometimes walk up to Cobb Creek, it's just about a quarter of a mile north of our house, and really the timber up there, there's, there's a lot of young like stuff, it's not real, I wouldn't call it real thick timber though, but boy when you get up, maybe it'll be cold, we walk up there sometimes pretty cold, maybe you're coming through this pasture here and boy it's cold as a dick and you get up there close to that creek, it's just like you're in a different, different land, you can't imagine the difference. That makes. It makes all the difference in the world. There's got to be that timber if there's nothing else to do it. In the woods where I, where I live, uh, we'll normally be from 10 to 12 degrees difference in temperature in Oakland City. We're certainly not that far away or that much difference, you know, from the stations. It makes difference. And uh, it's all the difference in the world. It's hot weather and all. Uh, of course, Trees certainly make it a lot cooler. Oh, you bet. Make it a lot cooler. Summertime, certainly. Warm it up in the wintertime. Same thing's true of grass. I don't know whether any of you ever walked out in the tall grass on prairie and lay down in the grass and got below the top of the grass. It's just as quiet as it can be. And you can hear it about that high above you. You can hear it just tearing across. I've done it just to, and just lie, lie there and listen to it. Uh, the stems of grass were similar to what the old wood, you know, sticking up in there. 
didn't look like there was enough grass up there to do that over your head, but it was sure there. And you could sure tell the difference. Of course, uh, that's a, a miniature windbreak. But uh, a tall grass prairie is, cuts that wind against the ground, cuts evaporation. A lot of things that way affecting moisture around that site. Uh, keeps the warm wind, hot winds away from it, things like that, I guess, when it comes out of the southwest. That certainly ought to affect the vegetation on the north side of it in the summertime. Well, don't you think the trees might have increased the moisture? Oh, yeah. In, the, in our land? I mean, I, I'm talking about like from Wichita Falls. Uh, Since they planted the trees. Well, I don't know how. I, well, the statistics say it is, but it seems like to me there's more things. Well, we're in a cycle of years. Oh, we learned so much about growing things too now. You know, we've got machinery and varieties and so forth. I can't, when I sit down to think what's happened in the 50 years since I started a professional career, I almost don't believe what's happened. And you can be so far out of date 10 years on varieties and things like that. It's, you know, we used to plant cotton. He's talking about planting that green sorghum two or three times. I had planted cotton up to five times. <laughs> When I was a kid, it would blow out or get it too early. Old cotton was sitting here. <laughs> Conservation Service, I'll be your moderator here this morning. We have three people who are going to be on the program here this morning. Murray Williams, who is the Conservation District Director of the Jackson County Conservation District. Bud Adams is a District Conservationist with the Soil Conservation Service. And Ray Foraker, who is the Superintendent here of the Research Center. So at this time, I'm going to call on Murray Williams to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the uh, irrigation and the drainage type of work they have in this area. Thank you. i get this straight. I'm not, a, right. I'm not a director on the soil conservation. I'm the director on the irrigation district. Okay. Uh, we uh, got irrigation here in 49. We got our first water. and. Uh, we, we went along real good for about 10 years, and then we started salting out or, or subbing out. Our water table raised and was holding our salts to the top of the ground, and, and we had acres, and right in this area in particular, that uh, wouldn't grow a crop. I mean, it, it wouldn't even grow, weeds wouldn't even come up on it. And uh, this land w was, getting pretty valuable for this this area and, and and to pay the water bill and the assessments and, and not be able to grow anything we had to do something and uh, there was several places that farms sold the farmers got discouraged and, and scared and and just might say backed off and quit them and uh, in 56 we, uh, well, go back before 56, the irrigation district bought a drag line and we started digging drainage ditches over the area. And, and I can show you some. There's one right right down the road there, about a half a mile. That's, a, that's just a, a drainage ditch. But it wasn't bringing our saw back quick enough. Or we could, we could get, some, we was getting some results from it, but we wasn't getting what we, we wanted as quick as we wanted it and uh, in 56 a man come along here a salesman selling tile the plastic tile or might I don't know what exactly what but anyway it was plastic with holes in it and uh, he said he was he could drain the land with it well we didn't at that time didn't have any machinery or anything to put it in with but but I bought a semi-load of it. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I, I bought it. But I, my plans at that time was to take a backhoe and dig a ditch and lay this tile in it. Well, when the, when the truck driver unloaded the tile, we unloaded it right up there a mile up the road here at the barn, he said, there's a man in Ohio that's got a machine that lays that tile and uh, with a laser. So we called him 
and he, or I did, and he came down, and uh, he seemed like it looked like if he could make some money, and this was a good area to move. So he moved down here, moved his machine, and we laid the first tile that was laid in this this county, or I guess this part of Oklahoma, or, or anywhere in Oklahoma, uh, right here on this farm, right right here. And I've got some pictures here of it. And uh, there was 17 acres, and, and we measured it out that there wasn't even a weed growing on. There was 40 acres that was marginal, that you could get a crop up and then it would die. And so the first tile that was put in was put on this farm right here. And it, it we emptied it over there into the drainage canal. And uh, in two years, you can drop in and we'll you can be around the road. Road. And I'll probably come out and there later this summer. Yeah. Then. You will? Be sure. Sure. Come up. Howard Carlton. Come up. October Big Festival there. Big Festival International. That's the only thing. Is that right? And it goes on sporting because they have no sense. Today is June 22nd, 1985. This is Joe Todd, an interview with Mr. Don R. Roberts in Woodward, Oklahoma. Sir, where were you born? Shattuck, Oklahoma. And when's your birthday? January 5th, 1946. 1946. Mm -hmm. Who's your father? Raymond Roberts. And your mother? Alec Roberts. What was her maiden name? Hedgecock. How do you spell that? H-E-D-G-E-C-O-K-E. Mm -hmm. Your parents both from Oklahoma? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of work did your father do? Well, he's retired now. He was with the railroad, Katy Railroad, for years. Mm -hmm. 48 years. What are your first memories of Shattuck? That's actually where I was born. I, I was reared in Laverne and Woodward, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. When did you start school? 1952. Where? Laverne. How big was Laverne in those days? Small. Is it smaller than it is today or bigger than it is today? Probably about the same size. It's it's grown and it's it's gone down over the years. So it's probably about like it was. How many kids were in school in the burn when you were going? In grade school, possibly hundred and fifty. Where did you go through high school? Woodward. Woodward. He graduated what year? 1964. 1964. After high school, what did you do? Joined the Navy. In 64? Oh, that would have been uh, February 1965. How come you joined the Navy? Uh, because I was number 19 on the draft list, and I wanted to go ahead and go, so I joined the Navy. Matter of fact, I tried to join the Army, uh, if you can believe that, and uh, the recruiter was out of town, and I joined the Navy instead, hmm. because the Navy recruiter was in town. Where'd you go through boot camp? San Diego. Tell me about boot camp. It was uh, a growing up experience. Uh, I didn't enjoy it at the time, but now that I look back on it, it was, uh, I have good memories of boot camp, really. What was your average day? What'd you do? From the time you got up till you went to bed? We uh, 
and got up and marched to the chow hall and we stood uh, at ease on the grinder, what they call the grinder. What's that? Uh, that's a large asphalt field and we stood by companies and waited our turn to get in line to the chow. And we went to various classes after uh, uh, we'd been to Chow Hall. Uh, practice marching. Uh, and every evening we washed our clothes by hand uh, at the barracks and hung them on a line. And then we had uh, some free time and then we, we had taps. What time did you get up in the morning? When was roughly? Well, approximately 6.30. Now, did the Navy have revelry? Is that what it's called? Mm hmm Okay. And what time was TAPS? About 9 p.m. How long was boot camp? Thirteen weeks. Thirteen weeks. Now this, um, from my experience in the Army, boot camp is to make you a foot soldier, infantry. Mm -hmm. What does boot camp in the Navy do? What does it train you to be? To be uh, disciplined, to be able to take orders, to grow up. Basically the same thing. That's what it did to me. You have to you have to learn discipline in order to to get along. Those who can't uh, were sent home. After boot camp, where'd you go? I came home on leave, and uh, my first orders was. Uh, actually in their uh, Naval Air Technical Training Center, Jacksonville, Florida. And I went to what they called A School. And it was uh, to uh, learn my vocation in the Navy, which was avi Aviation Ordinance. Okay. Aviation Ordinance, that's the armament on the mm -hmm. aircraft? On the aircraft. Okay. How long are you in Florida? Approximately six six months. From there, where'd you go? I was uh, ordered to uh, Lemoore, California, Naval Air Station, Lemoore, California. Uh, and I joined uh, Attack Squadron 164. What's an attack squadron? Attack squadron is a is an aircraft or a group of air, aircraft that carry the bombs. Fighter squadron uh, in the Navy uh, flies support, and they carry missiles in support of the attack uh, attack aircraft. What type of aircraft are in the attack squadron? Uh, A four Skyhawk. Carried uh, surface to ground missiles, uh, bombs, rockets, and 20 millimeter guns. Is this land based or? No, it was aircraft carrier. Aircraft carrier. The land base for, for the squadron was Lemoore, California, mm -hmm. and the uh, air base would have been the USS Risky. How many airplanes in the attack squadron? Approximately 25. Mm -hmm. Now, is it different from landing on land as opposed to a carrier? Absolutely. What's the difference? You have to catch a cable when you come aboard a carrier. Uh, the aircraft has a tail hook that comes down. And when they approach the flight deck, it catches a, a cable that's about inch and a half in diameter. 
that cable is spring loaded in some way or another where it gives for so far and then stops the, the aircraft. If you miss a cable, what happens? Uh, if they miss the cable, they, well, first thing is as soon as they hit the flight deck, they uh, give the aircraft full throttle. So if they don't catch the cable, then they go right on off. Also, I assume the flight deck is in motion yeah. on the ship. Constantly. What do you, any particular training for this? Well, flight? I didn't have anything to do with that. Yeah, so, okay. But uh, the aircraft carrier never stops in the water. Even if there's no operations, it never stops. I didn't know that. Ships don't stop at sea unless there's some kind of a problem. When the aircraft are landing, they're always the carrier is always turned into the wind, and when the aircraft are taking off, it's always turned into the wind. Hmm. What's the name of the aircraft carrier? You USS Ariskany. Ariskany. Okay. And when did you join the the tax squadron? That would have been in. From the War of California, where you go? Naval Air Station. Where'd you go from there? Uh, we deployed on uh, on board the, uh, the aircraft carrier Riskany, which was in, at that time the uh, it was based at uh, San Diego. We went aboard the carrier then. Uh, carrier Air Wing 16 is uh, the group that my squadron belonged to. There were uh, several other squadrons as well as, as my squadron that was actually a part of that air wing. Now you mean when you say air wing, what, what's an air wing? Air wing is a, would be a group of squadrons. I was in an attack squadron. There was, uh, we had a sister squadron that uh, also used the same type of aircraft and uh, attack aircraft and there was a photo reconnaissance squadron, there was two fighter squadrons, um, a squadron made up of SPADs. SPADs are uh, Korean War prop driven uh, aircraft. There was uh, a tanker, refueling tanker stationed aboard the Riskening. Uh, photographic squadron, uh, helicopters, a lot of airplanes. Now would you have a, a wing commander then? Is that, who's the squadron commander? Or do you have a squadron commander? We had a squadron commander, but I don't recall the gentleman's name. At okay. Time. What rank did he have? He would have been a full Navy commander. Okay. And then he's in the wing. The squadrons make up the air wing? The squadrons make up the air wing. Then there would be a uh, air wing commander also over what, all of the squadrons. What rank would he have? He would be a commander also. Okay. What rank did you have at this time? Well, at that time I was... Uh, Ordnanceman third class. Which is what? E three, E four? That would be E four. E four. Okay. What are your duties as aviation ordnance? We have to do with uh, all of the armament systems, all of the electronics uh, involved with the armament systems. Uh, Including the 20, I was actually over the uh, uh, 20 millimeter. I was crew chief for the 20 millimeter cannons. There was two of these on each of the of our aircraft. We had to uh, load the cannons and uh, check them out and make sure they fire, and test fire, and keep them in good shape. So we just met general maintenance on the on the cannons. Mm -hmm. That's a good chief duty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Would you tell me again what ordinance the aircraft carries? What type? Yeah. Okay, we had, uh, like I said, we had two 20 millimeter machine guns, if, if you want to call them that, on each aircraft. We had, uh, would carry 250, 500, 1,000, and 2,000 pound bombs. Uh, we used uh, air to surface missiles, Shrike missiles. We used uh, carried flares for night missions. And I believe that's it. Okay, now the different bombs. Um, 250, 500,000, 5,000 pound bombs. 2,000. 2, I'm sorry, 2,000 pound bombs. Now, are these anti-personnel bombs or what? what anti-everything bomb. Anti-everything. We, we use different, uh, depending on what the mission might be, was the type of armament that was used, you know. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. What's the bomb load of the, of the aircraft? I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you what the actual capability of the, of the aircraft could be. Uh, different planes, if we had a flight going out, why? Uh, say there was six or eight planes out of our squadron that would go out, they might be armed in a different different denomination of... Mm -hmm. of uh, depends on the well, mission? What, right, depends on what it was for that day. Yeah. What have you. Okay. And when did you go to the Gulf of Tonkin? Well, the first time would have been uh, in early 67, 1967. What was your first reaction when you found out where you were going? I was uh, young enough to want to see what was, was going to happen. What was the first mission that the aircraft had? I don't know what it would have been. Mm -hmm. So when, what are your duties when the airplane comes in? What do you do? Could we start with what the, what we do when the aircraft is ready to leave? Okay, yeah, from, okay. On a, what do you do in a mission? Uh, for instance, in the morning, say the first flight uh, might be due to take off at say seven. That means we would be up like at 5:45 and have all of the armament loaded, uh, have the guns loaded and everything, uh, have the fuses in the bombs, have the uh, lanyards hooked from the bombs to the bomb racks, have everything checked out and ready to go, and then the. Uh, Support people would come and start up all the jets, and uh, all the ordnance crew uh, would go forward and stand between the catapults. And uh, when each one of our, when it came to turn for our uh, aircraft to come forward to the catapults, uh, I would have to uh, give the the pilot the the good sign that everything was. Was all right. His armament was ready to to drop. It was fused. The guns were armed. Everything, and, uh, and he knew he was clear to go. That was about the last thing that uh, that we did before he left the aircraft carrier. So then they would be out, and uh, it would be fairly quiet around the ship until they started coming back in in approximately two hours. Once we started going like that, we'd have one flight out, and then uh, there'd be another flight that we would start uh, loading immediately after the first flight had gone, and so that they were constantly coming out, or coming in and going out, there was really not much break between them. Mm -hmm. Just went out in shifts. And then, yeah, I guess you'd service the 
the guns and everything came right. back in. When then. I come back in, uh, I'd uh, release the air pressure off of the uh, machine gun and uh, discharge the live round that might still be in the chamber on, uh, because they always dropped them down from the, uh, the, the uh, flight deck to the hangar deck and they wouldn't send an aircraft down if it had uh, any kind of live ordnance mm -hmm. ready to fire. So that had to be done before it went down the elevator. Okay. How does the catapult operate? It's a steam-driven uh, piston type of arrangement. Uh, they build up so much pressure and there's a cable that's hooked to the front of the aircraft and there's a another type of a cable hooked to the rear of the aircraft and there's a uh, piece of metal that's hooked between the two and when the aircraft is sitting there at full throttle and the only thing that's holding it is that piece of metal it is designed to give and break at a certain pressure so when the catapult jerks it it breaks and then the catapult uh, shoots the aircraft off the nose of the ship. How fast does it shoot it off? Probably, by the time it reaches the nose of the ship, it's probably moving, I'd guesstimate 50 miles an hour. Hmm. Now, is the airplane, I don't quite understand how catapult actually shoots the airplane? Well, the, the, the aircraft is sitting there at full throttle, yeah. and the only thing that's holding it is that that uh, sleeve of metal that's okay. hooked to a rear cable. Okay. Okay, and at, when they finally pull the thing, or they shoot that, that catapult, then that piece of metal will break and it will release the aircraft then. So the catapult doesn't actually push the airplane off. It pulls it off. It pulls it off. It pulls it off. Okay. okay. It pulls it off from the front. I've often, often wondered how those things work. I've seen them in movies, but I've never. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the aircraft, uh, some of them that had uh, afterburners, like the fighter squadrons, were F-8 Crusaders, and they had afterburners. On them, and they would. Uh, they had a heat shield that, when they came up to the catapults, they would raise a heat shield behind the engine exhaust, and just before they catapulted off, they would hit the afterburner. And if you've ever been around one of those, burner is, uh, is just kind of a supercharged burst that, that uh, gives the, the aircraft uh, more power to take off. Ever run the Battleship New Jersey? It was out there, I believe. Uh, I never did see it, no. We watched the fireworks. The incident I'm thinking of is when the aircraft carrier is it caught on fire, or what happened? It caught on fire. Tell me what happened. What did you do? Uh, it was uh, a normal routine morning, just like any other, and uh, before that first flight was ready to go out, it was approximately 7 a.m., and uh, we had all of the aircraft loaded, uh, and they were had been started by the support uh, team, and uh, they were ready to take off. Uh, they hadn't moved forward yet to the catapult area, but they were set, all sitting there running. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, this guy come running down the deck and giving it this, which was a signal for everyone to shut the aircraft off, kill the engines on them. And we still didn't know what was going on. 
and uh, just shortly thereafter, why there's expansion joints in the the deck of that carrier, uh, which allows the, the top deck to give, you know, during the, when the ship hits waves, it won't just shock, you know, it's just a it's just an expansion joint. Well, anyway, this uh, smoke started coming out of these expansion joints uh, from the hangar deck, and uh, it was real thick, looked like dirty whipped cream, and and then we, we finally realized, I thought someone maybe had caught a mattress on fire and thrown it out on the catwalk, is what I first thought. But uh, evidently, uh, what we used in the, for night raids over Vietnam was a, a magnesium flare. And uh, if you know anything about magnesium, you can't put it out with water. It's, it's a very hard to put out. But these flares, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of cases, were never used. Even though they went out on the aircraft, they uh, they came back and they were uh, taken off of the bomb racks and stored in this locker. And these uh, these flares had a metal lanyard that uh, come out of the nose of them, and we, they were taped. We had special instructions to tape this lanyard to the body of the flare. The flare was about uh, three foot long and approximately four inches in diameter. And after they'd been used several times, they got ragged, and evidently they were being mishandled down there in this flare locker when they were storing them. And somewhere or another, one of these lanyards got pulled, and it set the thing off in the hangar deck. And I understand that the particular sailor that was in charge of that panicked, and uh, because they're just they're extremely bright, these flares, and he threw this thing inside the locker along with the rest of them, and uh, slammed the the steel door, the hatch, and it just superheated in there in just a matter of you know seconds. And it melted the the uh, bulkhead. The steel wall was about an inch and a half thick, and it absolutely melted the wall down. And the heat was so intense that it uh, went right up the passageways. And anything that would ignite ignited just instantly. So uh, we start. The order came down. I was still on the flight deck. When, when all this was happening, I didn't know what it was that was happening. But the uh, order came down from the bridge to jettison all of the bombs, take all the bombs off of the planes, and to throw them over the side. There were also bombs on the hangar deck. Uh, the sailors were throwing them over. Uh, the superstructure that, that you see standing on the, uh, on the flight deck is called an island. And they always stored carts of bombs behind it, ready for the next flight to be loaded up. So we had to throw those all over, and as well as unload all of the aircraft of all the bombs. And uh, as a result of the fire, the entire forward part of the ship uh, was just uh, heavily damaged. There were 43 people killed. What was the major cause of death? Probably the intense heat and smoke. All the, even the, the uh, rooms that, uh, or the portion of the ship that wasn't actually burnt, uh, the walls were absolutely black, and uh, there's no way anyone could have, could have uh, lived through the smoke uh, and the heat. So, a lot of good people died. What should have been that sailor's reaction when that happened? What should he have done? Well, he should have tried to throw the thing over the side. Uh, now, how far was he from the side? He was only about 10 foot from a very large outside doorway that 
went right out to the railing, which he could have fallen over if, if he hadn't panicked. But he just didn't realize it at the time, I guess. And the first, his first reaction was to get out of there. Did he survive? I think so. Uh, what were you doing? You were on flight deck. I was on the flight deck, ready to send uh, help with that flight, the first flight uh, out that, that morning. And then what did you do when you, did you help throw the bombs overboard or what? Helped, helped uh, throw the bombs overboard, yeah. So what size bombs were they? Uh, various sizes, 250, 500,000 How do you pound. move a thousand pound bomb? By hand. We didn't have, we didn't have uh, any kind of loading machinery. We just uh, used manpower. How many men did it take to move a thousand pound ball? Oh, when you get tough, toughened up after you've been out of the line uh, long enough, you can do it with uh, probably five guys. Mm -hmm. One on the nose. And, uh, of course, you, I suppose all the adrenaline helps and you realize mm -hmm. the ship is on fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many bombs did he get through a port? I don't recall. It was it was such a uh, hurried thing that you know we were just moving as fast as we could to get rid of as much as we could. That was every bomb jetson. Everything that we could that had a chance to blow up if it got close to a fire was thrown mm -hmm. over. There were still bombs left in storage areas below decks, but in no immediate danger of of going off. Say. And how long of a time period are we talking about from the time the fire started until all the bombs were jettisoned? Probably 20 minutes at the most. What happened then? Well, they, the ship come to a dead stop. And that's something that I was telling you just doesn't happen yeah. unless something is really wrong. And uh, then I started bringing uh, aircraft and some of the victims up the, up the uh, elevators. The, the aircraft, the flight deck had two elevators, one in the center forward and uh, one on the uh, uh, left side. I believe that would be port. Mm -hmm. um, were all the aircraft brought up in the hangar deck? Uh, the, what there was room to put up on the on the flight deck. See, mm -hmm. the, the flight deck was already uh, had a lot of aircraft on it. So. Mm -hmm. so I don't recall how many of the aircraft were were damaged, but uh, probably half of those that were on the ship. Mm -hmm. Say 43 were killed on the ship. 43. How uh, many were injured? I believe there were 16 injured. Uh, at one at one point, uh, they realized that if they didn't do something pretty fast, that they were going to lose the ship. And so they gave the order. And, uh, evidently, they just couldn't contain the fire. So they gave the order to flood uh, the bottom two levels of the forward portion of the ship to uh, to keep it from catching on fire because that's where uh, the bomb magazines were as well as the uh, television onboard television crew and some of the there was a couple of sailors that uh, were actually drowned because they couldn't get out and uh, they just had to uh, make the decision to flood the compartment or let the ship go one or the other. So they, uh, and when I think of the Navy ship, I think of everything made of steel. Mm -hmm. And I don't see, why would the ship be lost? Because it couldn't contain the fire. What because was of the bombs. Because of the heat might mm -hmm. touch off the bombs. And when you talk about that kind of heat, uh, uh, 
generated by those flares. Uh, it would be so intense that even the paint on the walls would burn, see. How many flares were on were burning at that time? I don't know what was held in the magazine in the storage there. Uh, I would guess to be 500 flares or so. That'd be a big fire. It would be. It would have to be terribly hot to melt an inch and a half of steel. Mm -hmm. And it did. After the fire was contained, everything was settled back down. What did they do with the ship? Uh, the ship was still able to uh, navigate. So we headed for uh, Subic Bay, which is in the Philippines. fairly s slow pace, 10 or 15 knots, and started pumping the water from the forward section of the ship as we went. And it, everyone was pretty much stunned over what was what had transpired in just the last few hours. And I guess they had an idea that, that they would be able to repair the ship in uh, Subic Bay. When they got there, they realized they didn't have the equipment necessary or the manpower at that, uh, at that naval base to, to do any good, so we headed back to the United States. Mm -hmm. So you stayed on the ship then? Mm -hmm. How many crew were on the ship? Oh, approximately 2,500. Mm -hmm. Now, what class is it in of aircraft carrier? Is it in the four stall class or what? I don't recall what class mm -hmm. it was in. Mm -hmm. It was it was a Korean War uh, vintage uh, aircraft carrier, but it was one of the older ones. Then. Right, but it did have the angle flight deck on it, uh, similar to the newer ones. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, did you spend the rest of your career on that ship? Or? Uh, I made one more cruise on that ship uh, after it was repaired and uh, in the latter part of that year, the same year in 67. And then uh, I was dis discharged in uh, January of 68. Did they make any changes in handling of the flares? I'm sure they did, yes. Where were your sleeping quarters in the ship? Where did you stay? Uh, my sleeping quarters was uh, towards the the back, the fan tail. That's what they call it, mm -hmm. towards the tail of the ship, about uh, first first level down from the flight deck. Okay. Um, I'm not sure to have to ask this question, but if you have 2,500 men, where do you put them? Well, if you, in our squadron alone, we, we had one, one little section and we, we were uh, stacked, uh, our bunks were about four high and uh, about a shoulder's width between the bunks and they would be approximately uh, Hundred men in the size in the size of a normal size home, mm -hmm. plus your your lockers and it's pretty crowded. How do you feed twenty five hundred men? <clears throat> you just stand in line. I mean, do you eat in shifts or do you have one period where well, everybody eats? Or they had uh, uh, mess or chow hall hours. Say from breakfast would be uh, from 6 a.m. to 8:30, and you had to, if you were going to make it, you had to get get through the line sometime mm -hmm. during those hours. I've heard the story of sailors don't get seasick. Is that true? I never did. But an aircraft carrier is quite a bit different than a smaller like a cruiser or a destroyer. Mm -hmm. You don't feel the, even though the ship is uh, rocking, you, 
don't feel it so much because it's so big. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, what did you do while the ship was being repaired? Could you come home and visit your parents? I don't. I believe I did take leave because our our squadron when it the ship pulled in back into San Diego after the fire. Our squadron went back to the land base at Lemoore, California, and I believe I, I did take leave and come home at that time for two weeks. How soon after this accident could you notify your parents that you were safe? I believe I called them from uh, Subic Bay, Philippines. Now, did they know that you were on this ship? Oh, yeah, they knew I was on the ship. It took uh, probably five days or so, three to five days to get uh, between uh, the Gulf of Tonkin into the Philippines, and then I called. Did you have a problem getting through to talk to your parents? No. no. What was your mother's reaction? Because she knew that you were on the ship when she heard your voice. Well, they were relieved. Sure. <laughs> your mother told me she almost fainted. Mm -hmm. He was so relieved to hear your voice. Well, when I was going to Vietnam, I told my mother, if anything happens, you'll be notified by the Army. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, don't listen to anyone or anything. That's the way you have to take it, too. Yeah. Do you have any questions you want to ask them? Yeah. I've heard this story <laughs> several times. Has it just had anything? It. No, not really. Um, just, uh, just when you were talking about the cable, he said something one time about a cable snapping or something at one time. Oh yeah, there was a lot of inc incidents yeah, just that happened things for that, the uh, carrier, you know, not just the fire. Yeah, tell me some of them about the cable snapping. Okay, like I told you before, the uh, they have to catch the cable with the tail hook, and we had a, a very large aircraft stationed on the carrier and it was a tanker, uh, which meant that it carried uh, extra fuel and would uh, fuel up aircraft coming back in that were running low. And to see the thing, you would never, this aircraft, you would never think it would ever get off of a, of a flight deck or make it back on there because of its size. It was huge. Uh, but the thing is, it, uh, one, one evening, uh, I guess the, the standard procedure was that if, if uh, before they were to land the tanker, uh, if they hadn't expelled any of the fuel, they had to dump some of it to get rid of the weight. And the story was at that particular time they didn't. And it came back aboard too heavy. And when it caught the cable, uh, it broke it. And the aircraft went ahead and flew off, and the cable went right down the the flight deck. That steel cable, and like I, I said, the cable is approximately an inch and a half in diameter, steel. And uh, there were men standing in that forward portion of the ship, and the cable just went right through them. Uh, about three or four of them. Can we? And they did, it happened so fast they didn't know what had even happened, what had hit them. Uh, there were several instances similar to this. On one occasion, uh, of course, we had a lot of night operations. Uh, and we weren't allowed to have lights on the flight deck because of, it would bother the pilot's night vision see. So uh, on one particular evening, I almost walked into a prop, and a guy caught me before I did. Uh, we had one young man that had just rejoined the Navy and come back in, and he, he had the same job that I had, only in a different squadron, and he did walk into a uh, propeller. Uh, we were just uh, one other time... Uh, It was this uh, squadron of 
of spads, the prop driven planes coming back aboard and they had these rocket pods under their wings and these rocket pods held I believe four or five rockets in them and they were approximately five foot long and about four inches in diameter and these pods had a, a small keeper that was supposed to keep that uh, rocket in that pod unless it fired but when they sometimes when they come back aboard it would break that keeper and the rocket would come out of the pod and uh, in one particular instance uh, one of my fellow seamen and I were walking down the forward part of the ship and about the time one of these planes came aboard and landed and this rocket came out of the pod and uh, went right between us and we were just walking side by side. So it, did, I, it didn't scare me at the time but I went down and sat down and started thinking about how close it was. And uh, Where did the rocket go? It, uh, went up and hit a piece of equipment. It wasn't armed. In other words, it hadn't been fired. It just come out of the, the pod dead, see. Mm. But it come right between us. Did you know where all these planes would be going to drop them on? You knew their destination? No, no, we, uh, we weren't allowed any of that kind of information, so. Mm -hmm. And just where was the ship located? Uh, Along that Korean border? No, it would have been the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam border, in the Gulf oh. of Tonkin. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And what they call the line. They call it the line. Ever have any trouble with the Russian Navy or North Vietnamese ships? Uh, at one time, I, I never saw any ships. Uh, but there were spy boats that would come out from the coast. And uh, they all had, uh, one particular time, there was 32 of them. And they came out and they all had black sails. And they were the, the Japanese or the Chinese looking at what they call the junks. Mm -hmm. And they were, they said that they were actually out there spying to see who was out there. But there was 32 of them that we counted one, one morning. Did you ever have a red alert? Mm -hmm. And everybody became they, alert. They scrambled the planes. That would be the uh, the Russians, Russian recon uh, reconnaissance planes or patrol planes. They'd come fairly close, and they would scramble uh, two or three of our fighters off of the deck and uh, go up and escort them out of the range and come back. What did you do after you got your discharge? I came home. Happy to get home? Yes. <laughs> came home to Woodward, America. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't anything here anymore for me, so I ended up in Enid. What did you do over there? I went to work for C.R. Anthony, a salesman on the floor. What do you do now? I'm a terminal manager for Beaver Express Service at Wichita, Kansas. When did you get married? <coughs> March the... <laughs> <laughs> She's watching you. <laughs> March of 1969. Mm -hmm. He's he, he, you know the date, I won't ask the date. I know what it is. It slips my mind for the minute. Next March, you better remember. That's right. Mm -hmm. How many children do you have? I have two children. And, uh, Amy and Seth. Mm -hmm. How old are they? Amy is 11. Will be 11 uh, this next month. Do you like the work that you're doing? I've been involved in that type of work for this is my 11th year and I enjoy it. Oh, what's your wife's name? Diane. <laughs> what's the maiden name? Ellis. 
What did you meet her? Uh, at Enid. Well? And we were married here at Woodward in the uh, Episcopal Church, and Bernice was at the wedding. You remember that? That's your turn. <laughs> I'm sure you were. <laughs> Probably. Uh, what's the co-author of your book? Jill Carlisle. I was thinking she was there too. She was Your sister and I are very good friends. Mm -hmm. So is your mother and I. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful men. Love them both. Mm -hmm. Maybe Diane has something to tell us. Oh, about what? <laughs> Do you like living in Wichita? Oh, yeah, I really do. It's yeah. coming from, I lived in Enid for years, from about 25, I think, pretty close to that. And, um, which is home, it was just the right size for growing up, and I thought the right, at the time it was a good size for raising a family. But uh, with change of jobs and everything, and moving up there, I really didn't realize how little we did do or how little was available to us. In a larger city like that, and there's just. Are you from Enid? Well, basically, <coughs> my dad was in the oil fields when I was growing up, very small. So he traveled a lot. He worked on just the oil wells. Mm -hmm. He was just a tool pusher, I think, is the basic terminology for that. Know your grandparents? I never met them. Never met any of my grandparents. Did they come here in homestead? Uh, you know? My father's family did, and uh, my mother's family came from Amarillo, Texas, uh, to Knowles, Oklahoma, and my father's family came from Missouri, Taney, Taneyville, Missouri, to Knowles. When did they come? You know, I don't know. Why did they come to Oklahoma? Have you heard? I read an account of why everybody came to Oklahoma uh, because they thought there was a land of opportunity uh, to come to Homestead and to get some land. And well, thank you. Okay.